What's going on, everybody? Welcome into a special edition of the weekly Energy News Beat recap here on this gorgeous Saturday, April 13th, 2024. As always, I am Michael Tanner. We got a busy week, guys. A lot of stuff happened. You know, we saw, you know, the likes of everything. We had a great deal spotlight that dropped on Wednesday. Go ahead and check that out. But news was all over the place. I rocked two solo shows talking a lot about bricks and, and big oil. Um, Stu was in the chair Sunday, Monday. We were talking a lot about just some of the crazy stuff. The Eclipse stopping solar of course we had to slip one of those stories in there though but i'm gonna let the team reach into the barrel find some of our top segments and play them for you today as always guys just remember all the news and analysis you is brought to you by the world's greatest website www.energynewsbeat.com appreciate it guys we will let you go we'll see you on monday why gas prices in california have gone ballistic you gotta love a good ballistic story. The Golden State average at the pump surges 23 cents to 527 per gallon on Friday from a week ago, according to the uh, AAA. Um, Tom Closa, head of the energy analysis at OPSIS, refinery challenges the main culprit for California's surging prices. Challenges? I call it a shotgun to the crotch is what I call it. Throw in regularly scheduled maintenance that will occur at two critical refineries in May and the normal pennant uh, for speculative buying in global markets in the second quarter. And you have wholesale prices that have gone ballistic. I guarantee you, you're going to see more and more diesel and gasoline being bought from Michael. Hold on. Hold on. China through Russia. No, they're buying it from China. You heard it here second. First, you heard it here in first from Newsom and President Z in California. Any student of petroleum history recognizes that these relationships won't persist, said Clausa. A correction for gasoline and perhaps crude looms, and it also will occur in the next 30 days. It is absolutely abysmal what they're doing. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, they don't want people to drive. This is legislation through regulation. I had an opportunity to go to a great event uh, hosted by um, Texans. I It, it was uh, who Genevieve Collins. Who is she part uh, of? Um, Americans for Prosperity. Americans for Prosperity. Uh, they're she's a Texas great. Based, she's a yes. great, great person. I had an opportunity to go to an event hosted by them where Congressman Austin Fluger, who's a, the congressman for Midland Odessa, great guy. We need to get him on the podcast. And RT Trevino. We love RT. He's the he's a president of Trevino Family Resources, Pecos Country Operating. He had an opportunity to have two minutes in front of the congressman, and I'm so glad he did this. He sounded exactly like used to. He pointed out that small operators and 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 small businesses are getting regulated out of business because of all this stuff and this is exactly this goes into exactly what they're talking about they're trying to add in more taxes more regulations more things that make ga gasoline more expensive so there's the only the only the only place you're going to be end up going to get gas is a california national gas station owned by president z and Newsom. Yep. Yep, a, a, a joint venture between California and China. That if I ever have to cover that on the deal spotlight, I'm just jumping. I'm just gonna go jump out the window. I'm on do the third remember, floor of an apartment. I'm just gonna dive in head first. Do you remember three years ago when you and I were covering the tanker shortages and they were lined up in the bay? Mm -hmm. and China says. You all know uh, what going on. And they wanted to come on our show. They wanted to interview us for the China mainland TV. Do you remember that? Yeah, because on uh, because <laughs> on top of being Putin's political advisor, you're also Xi, you know, President Xi's no, political they, advisor. They, they were like, he taught truth. <laughs> <laughs> Critical impact. Chat GPT consumes 500 milliliters of water for every 50 texts you send it. Miss uh, producer, could you call this picture up? 
I about threw up when I actually saw this one. There, it, it is a gr gruesome looking picture. Uh, for our podcast listeners, it is a uh, modern looking C3PO that actually looks kind of scary with a human looking tongue drinking some water. So that's got to be a cyborg looking kind of a thing. Um, but anyway, that was generated by chat GPT. So if you're not thirsty before, or after but before you see that you are thirsty after looking at that scary thing here's where it gets really scary um sean wren a researcher at the university of california riverside and the one of the authors of the paper cited saying that training gpt3 and microsoft state-of-the-art u.s data centers used 700,000 liters of clean fresh water but the real problem is going to come when the public becomes increasingly obsessed with asking their ai assistance questions um and so that's a lot. And when you well, here's what it, this is the scariest part. The paper goes on to say that global AI demand, do, you know, forecasted, obviously global AI demand may mean that we draw between 4.2 and 6.6 .6 billion cubic meters. And that's three. That's that's multiply that by three because you're talking about meters to feet. OK, because this is a UK study. So 4.2 yeah. to 6.6 .6 billion cubic meters of water in 2027, which is half of the current water use in the uk oh you think there's a drought now you ain't seen nothing yet which is re i had when i read this article i was like i had no idea i didn't either and it just absolutely abounds it's scary the only way ai is going to work michael is nuclear period mm -hmm. But you still need to cool it. I came across an interesting company re recently, Hedge Resources, that has a modular uh, Bitcoin mine that they cool it using the produced water from an oil well, and it evaporates. So not only do you not have to use fresh water, but you can also save on your produced water costs. Instead of having to truck it off, you just pipe it, pipe it through a Bitcoin mine, and it evaporates towards the end. That We're going to have to innovate like, Things like that are going to have to become more mainstream in order for this stuff to work. I need to I need to visit with him on the podcast. I want to learn more about. Yes, that. we'll get you hooked up, uh, Chris and Andrew over there. Very very great guys. But no, we're, you're gonna the market's gonna have to come up with solutions like that to solve this problem because this is a this is a second third order effect that everyone's talking about electricity. Nobody's talking about water. Oh no, water's huge. And especially when you get Cow Schwab up there going, you will have no water and be happy. Honestly, yeah, he, he said that. Exxon's expanded UK refinery to supply first diesel in early 2025. Michael, this one is actually smart move by Exxon Mobil. ExxonMobil is expanding its UK site and will start delivering diesel from the expanded Folly refinery in early 2025. Uh, the diesel pr uh, producing unit could be reconfigured later to make jet fuel or sustainable aviation fuel oh, from man. vegetable oils. Okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to borrow somebody's, um, never mind. Uh, there's a lot of molecular magic we can do with this kit. I think that's great, but diesel is going to be around for a while. And yep. the fact that this is a newer investment into downstream that can be do used in multiple different ways is the way it should be done. Yeah, awesome. I mean, this is what you should be doing in terms of an R&D fund. Exactly. You know, as an oil and as an integrated oil and gas company like Exxon, these are the type of investments you should be making, in my opinion, versus you know doing what Total Energy does, doing what Equinar does, going and buying and BP, going and buy on these wind farms. This is a much better type of investment as an integrated oil and gas company. So I applaud this, and the UK needs the diesel. So oh, yeah, and low low sulfur. I'm all in. I am all in for the low sulfur diesel. And uh, 40% could reduce imports into Britain. That is huge. Yeah. Uh, that is absolutely well done. Hats off to ExxonMobil. Yep. Oh, the picture is absolutely horrific. I don't know who, who can did we this get one. that, Mr. Producer? Can you hey, pull this one up smokes. here? Speaking of a eclipse today. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. Global elites have no master plan to replace crude oil other than lining their wallets. This is actually from Ron Stein and I'm interviewing him next week on the 16th. And this is actually, he's a good friend of the show. The elephant in the room that no one wants to discuss is that crude oil is the foundation of our materialistic society. It is the basis of all products and all fuels demanded by the eight billion on this planet to only 1 billion existed less than 200 years ago. Wow. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, crude oil, this is something people forget, Michael. Crude oil is n- almost never used to generate electricity, but when manufactured into petrochemicals, it is used for vet- virtually everything else. Even Diablo Canyon, like we just talked about. Yep. Yep. You can't make, uh, you know, half of the stuff. You can't use the petrochemicals for your microphone, for your, uh, you know, your iPhone or any of the things that you need. Yeah, you can have power, but you got to have oil to make your iPhone. No, you, you absolutely need it. So crude oil products are essential. And I, 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 I'm all in for doing this without crude oil. There'd be nothing that needs electricity. What a line from Ronald. Everything that needs electricity to function like iPhones, computers, data centers, x-ray machines is made with petrochemicals. Got to hand it to him. And then Miss producer, if you could bring this up, life without oil is a, a graphic that is amazing. Um, yeah, you can have nuclear, you can have wind farms, but you ain't going to have medicine, cosmetics, and holy smokes. You know what? There'd be a lot less wrecks on the highway if we had no cosmetics. Women would not be putting makeup on in traffic. I think that that would be phenomenal. What do you think? Um, I'm more worried about the medicine, to be honest with you. I'm more worried about no medicine, but um, and absolutely unbelievable. We love Ronald Stein. We do. The U.S. urgently needs a bigger grid. Here's a fast solution. You know, one of the biggest obstacles to expanding clean energy in the United States is our massive lack of power lines. Building these new transmission lines can take basically more than a decade. It's absolutely unbelievable. But according to a re- recent report released Tuesday, they're actually use a cheaper solution. You can actually go in and replace these existing power lines with, quote, state-of-the-art materials that could roughly double the capacity of the electric grid in many parts of the country, making room for much more electrical capacity. This technique, and I'm reading directly from the article right now, this technique known as advanced reconductoring is actually widely used in other countries, but many U.S. utilities have been slow to embrace it because of their unfamiliarity with the technology as well as the regulatory and bureaucratic hurdles according to the research. This is unbelievable. So this is a senior, I'm going to quoting now a senior scientist, Amol Pradak. He's out of the University of California, Berkeley, who said, we were pretty astonished at how big of an increased capacity you can get by reconductoring. It actually, he goes on to say, quote, it's not the only thing we need to do um, is upgrade the grid. It's not the only thing we need to to upgrade the grid, but it can be a major part of the solution. What's crazy, though, is that this has already been proven not only around the country, but in the United States. So in 2011, AEP, a utility in Texas, urgently needed to deliver. And again, I'm reading directly from the article, urgently needed to deliver more power to the Rio Grande, uh, the lower Rio Grande Valley to meet soaring population growth. It would have taken too long to acquire land and permits to build towers for new transmission lines. Instead, they turned to this refactoring idea and replaced about 240 miles of existing line with these advanced conductors it took less than three years and increased the carrying capacity of the lines by over 40 percent which is unbelievable so you wind and solar junkies out there you should all be for advanced conductoring because it can absolutely do exactly that so the why hasn't this really happened yet well there's an interesting article um or part of this article where basically it says 
you know, the incentives are also a little bit mismatched. I'm going to go back to reading straight from the article now. Because of the way in which utilities are compensated, they often have more financial incentives to build new lines rather than upgrading existing equipment. Well, that's sweet. I'm glad that's the incentive so that we can have a suboptimal grid. That's great to know. Conversely, now I'm back reading from the article. Conversely, some regulators are wary of the higher upfront cost of advanced conductors. Quote, even if they pay out for themselves in the long run, many utilities have also also little motivation to cooperate with one another on long-term plant transmission planning. And that comes back to the fact that the United States is run on three grids by over 3,200 different utilities and a massively complex patchwork network of regional planners and regulators. So trying to get anybody on the same consensus is super tough. But if those are the only two things holding us back from a better grid, we already knew this. We're idiots, though. We've got to... I was reading this article like, wait, it's already here. The text proven. We've already actually used this in Texas. It's unbelievable, folks. It makes you think they don't want the grid to get better. It makes you pause and think, do they actually want to make the grid better or do they want to? Or what do they want to do? I, I don't even I won't even speculate on what they want to do. The point is, I have a feeling they're either dumb. They're not dumb. So which means they must know. And it means there there's other quote unquote mismatched incentives. So absolutely crazy article, guys. We, we can have a bigger grid. Big oil and gas firms deepen investment in carbon capture. Um, you know, this is a really interesting. I love the first line of the article here. Carbon capture companies find themselves in an odd position. You know, obviously everyone thinks they're here to, you know, they're the ones and and taking the brunt of this climate change debacle that's going on but ironically they're also the people that are on the forefront of this new carbon capture futures market you know in, in an inch you know this this article you know kind of basically says that that tension is now i'm going to read straight from the article on full display in the recent acquisition of funding was earlier this month the carbon capture um startup ion clean energy raised 45 million dollars in series a funding round led by chevron Ion says its ICE 31 liquid ambient solvent stays intact longer and captures more carbon dioxide from the common emission streams um, than conventional options can. Chevron says it plans to integrate ICE 31 into its growing carbon capture and storage, otherwise known as CCS. Um, in 2023, we all remember that they bought 50% stake in the Bayou Bend, which is a large carbon capture storage facility in Houston and invested in the carbon capture tech from Carbon Clean Solutions and another one, Savant. Monte. Um, Schlumberger is also getting in on the um, Aquas on it, you know, earlier this year. Um, they bought an 80% stake in the CCS tech provider, Akron Carbon Capture. That was worth about $400 million. In March, Total went ahead and dove in um, and bought Talos Low Carbon Solutions for about $150 million. Um, that the main asset in that deal in to, to, Total's low carbon solutions is a 25% stake in that famed Bayou Bend. Equinar also owns another 25% of the project. You know, it's pretty crazy. And I think the other interesting thing that this article points out is that this, while it looks like it's accelerating, it's not actually entirely new. BP is an admin investor in CO2 mineral startups for over 10 years. You know, U.S. Steel has, as you know, or they've signed a deal with U.S. Steel to start carbon capture. You know, th this is a, a trend that has been going on for a while, but recently has ramped up quickly. And I think it shows the dichotomy of, you know, Diversifying your asset base. If you're ExxonMobil right now, or you're Chevron, you're one of these large oil and you know, you know, international IOCs. Um, you're you've got excess profits right now with $85 oil. It does probably behoove you to go ahead and say, okay, let's maybe dive in and look at what at some of these alternative sources because you know there's tax deductions around it. We know there's funding available from the government, you're going to get great tax benefits because of it. But also it, it may diversify you and a little venture money never hurt anybody because if it does take off, great, you're in an exact position um, to capture. So very interesting, big oil and gas friends deepening their investment in carbon capture.